So sleep apnea is a very common issue here in the United States. Uh, we estimate around 20 million individuals suffer from at least moderate to severe sleep apnea symptoms. Sleep apnea is something uh, usually that a patient will not come in and tell us they have. It's mostly going to be related to excessive daytime sleepiness symptoms, sometimes cognitive impairment, memory loss, just feeling pretty sluggish throughout the day. Um, of course, we know untreated sleep apnea can lead to a variety of cardiovascular issues, including uh, coronary artery disease and stroke. We'll always ask a few questions when a patient walks in the door, especially if they have no prior diagnosis of sleep apnea. We're going to check to see if you have any history of snoring, if you have ever had any witnessed apneic episodes, that is, you've ever stopped breathing at night, and uh, perhaps your bed partner has noticed this or a family member has noticed this. Sleep apnea can really affect all ages, it can affect all sizes, and uh, really we, we do know that men tend to be more affected than women, um, and we do know that as you get older the risk of developing sleep apnea perhaps goes up a bit, uh, but we do know small children can also be affected by sleep apnea, so uh, there's no one-size-fits-all as far as how you have to look uh, or what age you have to be in order to have these sorts of symptoms. If you are somebody who thinks they have a sleep apnea diagnosis or perhaps have some of the telltale risk factors like snoring uh, or a bed partner who's noticed something abnormal at night, the first thing to do is really talk to your primary care doctor. They'll be able to ask you some of the initial questions to stratify your risk and see if you're a good candidate to obtain a sleep study. We know CPAP works, but we know it's cumbersome. We know many patients fail just due to non-compliance. And so over the years, there has been this uh, bevy of interest looking at surgical treatment options. And one of the newer devices that's come on the market over the last few years has been the Inspire hypoglossal nerve stimulator implant. It's essentially a small battery powered implant that goes into the upper part of the right chest. It's somewhat analogous to a pacemaker or a defibrillator as far as the size of the device. It's hidden under the skin, it cannot be seen. There is a stimulator a lead that is essentially a wire that travels into the neck to connect to a specific nerve that controls the tongue movement and there's a sensing lead that goes into the area around the lungs. The goal of the device is that when you're asleep the device turns on and every time you breathe in or inspire that nerve stimulator goes off and is able to move the tongue slightly forward and help you breathe. Currently, we are the only program in Nebraska offering the Inspire device, and we're very excited to be able to bring this program to our population here. It's very important to us that we select the appropriate candidates for this Inspire device. Not every single patient with sleep apnea will be a candidate. Uh, we are going to look at factors like your body mass index or body weight, uh, potentially uh, factors such as the severity of your sleep apnea, and also anatomic factors. If the base of your tongue or the tongue movement is not what is causing a lot of the obstructive events for you at night, you may not uh, really benefit from this device. Patients who have this device implanted eventually uh, receive a patient remote. So you are the individual controlling the device. It's wirelessly connected. You're able to turn on and off the device and also adjust some of the settings at home. So it's very easy to use. This uh, particular implant, we're fortunate enough that m many, if not most, insurance companies will cover this for patients who have trialed and failed CPAP therapy at home. Uh, it's also important to note that it is covered by Medicare and uh, VA hospitals. The Inspire implant is typically an outpatient procedure performed under general anesthesia, which means the patient is completely asleep. It generally takes around two hours to place the implant, and it's performed through three small surgical sites one located just below the jawline on the right side, one just below the collarbone on the right side, and also a small incision around the ribs in order to place the sensing lead. So patients are able to resume almost a full activity after a few days, and we expect them to be essentially on over-the-counter pain medication as they heal and recover. <music>